Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, a podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Plain Spoken. I'm Derek Fournier, your host. And today I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming a dear friend and esteemed colleague, Andy Schwab, to our podcast. Andy and I trace our camaraderie and collaborative spirit back to our days at Disney, a time that laid the foundation for a friendship built on mutual respect, shared passions, and leadership philosophies that have guided both of us through our careers thus far. Andy's not just a visionary in the realm of technology and innovation. He's a hands-on leader who embodies the principle that true leaders never ask of others what they wouldn't do themselves. This ethos has been a cornerstone of our work together, driving us to lead by example, whether we're in the boardroom or troubleshooting problems on the ground. And God knows we've been on the ground together far too often than we want to talk about. But beyond the world of technology and leadership, Andy and I share a love of the finer things in life, namely the art of smoking meats and the enjoyment of Jameson Irish whiskey. These shared interests have not only cemented our friendship, but have also provided us with a much needed respite from our demanding roles, offering moments of reflection and camaraderie. As someone who's seen Andy in action, I can attest to his innovative thinking, his unwavering commitment to his team, and his ability to lead transformative initiatives that leave a lasting impact. Today, we'll dive into the insights and experiences that have shaped his approach to leadership, the challenges and triumphs he's encountered along the way, and the principles of purpose, authenticity, and trust that resonate with both of us. So sit back, pour yourself a glass of Jameson if you're so inclined, and join us as we explore the journey of a leader who truly goes beyond compensation embodying the spirit of commitment and innovation in every endeavor. So with all of that entry, Andy, I welcome you to the show. Uh, and and I, I asked a question in my first episode. We were on episode two officially because episode zero was the intro to the podcast because I'm a geek and I started with zero. Um, but I, I ended up asking this question. I, I just want you to open up. Give us a little bit of a, a, a microcosm of your journey. Tell us how you got here, your experiences, what shaped your approach to leadership and innovation and technology. Well, you go back a long time ago. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I graduated UCF um, and got a job working at the Space Center. And I was uh, working for McDonnell Douglas at the time, working on um, launching the space shuttle program. And uh, that's where I got my technical chops. So when I look back at my life, there were two, two places that I had an opportunity to work and learn. Um, and I would say this, the space center is where I got my technical jobs. They trained the heck out of me. You know, I came in as an electrical engineer with a software interest. And this is back in the days when that was a, a newish thing, sort of. Um, and so, you know, I, uh, I, I was the guy who, who could speak both um, electrical and software things, but they trained me on networking and servers and, you know, and I think that's where I also got my point of view that anything is possible. I I was not afraid because anything you do at the space center or in the space program, um, no one's done before. And so everything we did was no one's done before kind of thing. Um, and so I think that is my foundation of, you know, we can figure it out. We can do whatever. Let's let's just stop and think about it. So I think that was a great foundation. Um, you know, the next step in my journey was we went, I went to work for Lockheed Martin in their advanced technology labs. And that was, um, again, software related and doing stuff no one's ever done before. Um, it was funded by DARPA. We helped develop concepts like agile methodology. We helped develop um, like the first generation firewalls because the internet was brand new. Um, how do you protect against that? And how do you use the internet to do interesting things? Um, and so, you know, it was an opportunity to, to, to be in a place and learn um, about technology and things that, uh, that you know, we're going to change the world. And, and DARPA was a big funding agent to that. And we helped 
kind of work through some of those things. After that, um, I went to work at Disney. And so Disney is where I grew up um, and learned all my leadership skills. So Disney is a fantastic place um, to develop people, to grow, um, to have a broad perspective of what business means. Um, you know, starting, uh, I was a, a PM in the merchandise retail area on the IT side. And which was, the, by the way, if you looked at my history, I came from aerospace and very technology minded people to a business oriented place. And I remember being interviewed um, by Jerry Godet, who who was just a great mentor. He had started at Disney um, when he was 19, knew Walt um, and ended up retiring um, after 50 years, I think, um, some large number. But anyway, short he, timer. Yeah. So he interviewed me and said, um, but you don't know anything about business. And I said, but I know technology and it's all and I can make anything work. And so he goes, OK, we'll give you a try. So I ended up uh, and from that point on, I became the first CTO for the Walt Disney Company theme parks uh, division. Um, I led their new technology organization, both at the theme park level and uh, at the corporate level. So I was involved in studios to um, theme parks to everything um, and helping where technology and innovation kind of intersect. Disney is known to be the storytelling place. I learned all about, you know, as much as I could because I was super interested in storytelling, um, but how technology can drive experience. And so that's kind of where I started down that path was I was like, wow, technology can really enable um, great stories, great uh, um, experiences, et cetera. So it was it was all about um, being innovative, thinking through what what they are the possible, what the world is doing outside. How can we leverage that in here? Um, and so that's where I think we we kind of grew. I grew up personally, both in leadership and then in the in the experience space. And then so I want to I want to I want to interrupt you there for a second, because there's a couple of things that you glossed right through, probably because, well, you live them. They're your lived experiences, so they don't seem you know, significant in some ways. Maybe they do. Maybe you sit around and, and bask in the significance of your experiences when I'm not looking. But a couple of things you mentioned, you were at the forefront of the development of the agile process and methodology, right? Yep. That that was just like a six second sound bite, but that's non-trivial as it literally transformed the face of software development as we know it. Yeah. So so the the point, the reason what we were doing on behalf of DARPA was DARPA had lots of programs that they were working on that involved software development and microcontroller software development. So those two combined. And the cost to provide that was significant. They learned, right, which is why agile development um, came about, was that you have all these assumptions baked up front in your, in your cycle that by the time you get to the product at, at the end, those assumptions may have changed or you misinterpreted some... You know, and then you have to start over again and start back. That's you know kind of the downfall of waterfall. So the the iterative development methodology that we proposed, um, working with SRI out of um, um, I think it was uh, Berkeley Stanford at the time, we brought in some. Do you remember some, what SRI is? Um, I cannot. That was a long time ago. All right, um, no worries. I'll I'll Google it and look it up. But they they you know we proposed this concept of this iterative cycle that would allow things to go through. And, you know, at that point, um, it, it, we demonstrated it, we built um, models and how to talk about it um, and how that could help enable assumptions to be baked into the cycles as you move forward. So, you know, it was, it was early on in the, in the whole process that, that, you know, we realized that was a path we needed to go down. And so DARPA helped fund that. And then these companies spun out and they became, became things. Um, another thing in their lives, I, as I mentioned, was the, the internet was was building this concepts of firewalls and special computers that had dual NICs that allowed incoming and outgoing packets to be filtered <laughs> through software um, because the internet was going to be commercialized and it was going to go beyond, you know, point to point university and government agencies. We wanted to be able to use it as a collaborative and communication tool. Um, so, you know, we worked with several companies to help develop some of those um, ideas as they move forward. And, you know, that's the days of Netscape. And then, um, you know, the concepts of SSL to encrypt transactions and then HTTPS and 
some of those other things. So, you know, I was there to see it. I mean, I didn't invent all that stuff, but it was helping drive those <laughs> concepts, you know, to, to, to help enable um, some of those things. I don't want to be like Al Gore and say I invented the internet, but you know, it's, it was, it was fun to be part of that, right? It was fun to be part of the thinking through and asking the questions and challenging the thoughts um, to get us. And then to, now to look back and say, wow, you know, it's just become part of life. I kind of feel that's where, where AI is headed today is we're kind of at that early kernel. Yeah. So I'm glad you, you pulled that thread together. I suspect we're going to end up there because when you think about the cyclical nature of innovation, that's what you see, or, and, and whether you call it cyclical, or I used to call it the old man sine wave. Like when I got into tech, you know, AS 400s were there all the rage and we had guys that had been working on COBOL for 400 years. They had to call back in for the Y2K threat because no one knew how the hell to operate on those platforms yeah. because right. they had new things called personal computers, right? And now we've got the, you know, everything's migrated to the cloud, but I don't know about you, but recently I've seen the retraction from the cloud. We want to pull back away from everything being in the cloud all of a sudden. Now that we've got low earth orbit satellites and connectivity is ubiquitous until yesterday when, uh, you know, cellular it's communication it's dropped out for everything. Right. So it's it's funny, you know, you were at the forefront of that fad that they called the internet. And, and as it turned out, it wasn't a fad. Now, when you were doing this work with Agile, um, you know, because I'm an old spiral waterfall guy from my Microsoft days, and and I am not necessarily the warmest towards some of the Agile methodology. It's become almost culty in some ways in my mind. But one of the reasons why I had heard, and I don't know if this is when you were doing it or whether you've res if this resonates with you, was the old models of spiral and waterfall. You had fewer job titles and broader responsibilities. We had a, a role called a program manager. And program managers had to have an immense number of skills from technical depth to communication capability to testing awareness, right? Those people were really hard to find. Not to say that developers weren't hard to find and great testers aren't hard to find. Those skills are all hard to find. But finding a jack of all trades or a Jane of all trades, right, was really, really hard. And so Agile did a great job down the road, I suspect, from where you intersected with it, yeah. breaking those into discrete roles and responsibilities. Was that something that you experienced when you were doing it or was that post? You know, we we postulated the methodologies and how to lay it out. We didn't we did not get into the depths of how you organize around it. Um, gotcha. So it was it was really the, the breakthrough concept was everybody was doing waterfall. Everybody was doing things in a serial, yeah. maybe par peril ish f fashion. But the concept of iterating on new requirements and chewing them as you went and modifying input the input side of the equation for the output um, was, was novel. And so I think that's where we spent a lot of our time was working through those issues, you know, how you then build teams around it and things like that came out much, much later, but it was all, it was all intended to, to shorten the, the development cycle and lower costs for the government. That, that was it. I mean, that was the pr prime motivation. And, you know, I think we find that it, as all as trends go in, in our industry, um, there's some gr good things out of it, but not everything that you promised is real and not everything actually works out. And there's things that we learn as we go and, you know, you modify. But, um, you know, I, I do think that that the concept of you'll get all your requirements perfect up front and you'll develop it and it'll be perfect in the end is, was always a false assumption. And that never happens. Right. And so right. I think the iterative nature is what I think really was the was the benefit there. Yeah, and I think a lot of that was driven by the complexity of production, testing, and release. And when you can drive out the complexity, decrease the cycle time, you can get your requirements gathering and delivery to a tighter timeline. And that's one of the great things yeah. about Agile, right? Though though you could argue that it would be the great thing about a bunch of little, little tiny waterfalls or really tiny spirals. <laughs> yeah, I guess. So, but uh, but then, then we move on to the next thing that was almost like an aside. Did I hear you correct or correctly? Uh you were the first CTO for Walt Disney Parks. Yeah, yeah. Um, that I want to let that I want to let that <laughs> land on people for a second. Walt Disney is a big the Disney Corporation is massive, right? And as a Floridian, right, uh, this is in our backyard. So tell us a little bit about that because that is not an aside. Uh, okay, so I, you know I work for um, a really great uh, CIO, uh, Roger Berry, who's who's. Uh, retired and living in Austin, Texas, but he was a CIO and I told him, and, you know, and when he came on board and I think I was a PM at the time and he was kind of meeting all, all these people. And I think I must've been identified as somebody that had some potential at some point. 
um, with a lot of patience and a lot of <laughs> educating, I might get there. Um, um, and again, another great mentor, Randy Brooks, I think is probably the responsible for that. But um, he asked me what I want to do. I said, I, I, I want to be a chief technology officer one day. And, you know, darned if I didn't get there. And I think it's partly due to the recognition. So Disney is a company, an old school company. Um, CIOs reported up to the CFO because they ran the mainframes and had COBOL and did jobs, um, payroll and reporting and that kind of stuff. I think it was really a recognition um, as a company, the shift. I mean, I could argue that that Disney has always been driven by technology. When you talk about the first patents that Walt had or the multiplane cameras and and the way they innovated in their and leveraged technology to do storytelling. But at, at theme parks, I think it was it was a recognition that technology has become embedded and is going to drive our business. It's not just going to be the reporting function. It's not just going to be, um, you know, the thing that that, you know, manages PCs and make sure that the printers work. Um, which is kind of where IT was regulated, <laughs> or, you know, uh, uh, for years. But this is where, you know, and I help do that. So one of the, one of the opportunities I had was go launch um, Disney Cruise Line. And then after Disney Cruise Line was launched, um, the CIO then at the time um, said, hey, what do you what do you want to do? And, he, and, I, and I said, do you want to stay at the cruise line or do you want to come back to the parks? And I said, well, I don't know. What are my options? Well, they they were they had been told by their business that we really want IT to drive more innovation and and as opposed to being just kind of a, a group that does that. And so that's when they gave me license to go form the, what was now what was then. I call it a new technology group. I'm not great at naming or marketing, but it was a new <laughs> NTG, um, NTG technology group. <laughs> and I and I gathered up some really, really <clears throat> bright people um, that were fun to work with, very creative minds plus technology. And we we formed an organization that really had license to um, think beyond what had to be delivered tomorrow, which is kind of where IT was what was at. And so, um, you know, we, we developed um, five core concepts, pervasive computing, um, the, the idea of RFID and tracking people. Um, and we had been tracking those things because we believed that those things were going to have an impact on the theme park experience at some point in time. Um, and so we every year we had what was called an expo, a new technology expo. And it was it was our our goal was to show where the world was headed. And how that might uh, implicate a line of business, whether it was retail, whether it was the theme park experience, whether it was um, service, uh, you know, Disney's known for their service. And so we we took a convention center. I mean, fortunately, Walt Disney World, um, fantastic place to do stuff. Uh, we yeah. took a convention center and our team built out these mock-ups um, that were just fantastic. And I never forget walking into our very first one. And my jaw drops as the team had built out this incredible thing. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble, I guess. <laughs> it was that money. And we built this thing and it was fantastic. It was fantastic. And um, the business would come through and go, oh, you know, and it, it was just meant to spur. Look, we could we could think about things differently. Let's not do the same things the same old way. And so every year we would do one of these and, and we would push the envelope and think about and create, you know, a, a retail location where, you know, um, where you might, let's think about shopping differently. Can you do, do stuff and um, like, you know, um, tagging and well, that all kind of led to eventually, you know, uh, Al Wise coming to, to us and saying, you know, we want to take the theme parks to another next generation. This is, I think, back in the 2007, eight timeframe. Um, and he, and he, he picked me uh, he picked a couple other people, a couple people from WDI and said, you know, we want you to to reinvent the theme park experience. And so at that opportunity, you know, I had an opportunity to help to envision what it, we called then NGE, Next Generation Experience. Um, and that was based on the Magic Band program, basically leveraging technology to attack problems in the theme park, like wait times were great. And so that make the wait time better, make dining better, make, make 
take out friction, getting through the parks, making just being in the parks better. And so we spent two years envisioning what that was. We built a, you know, a much larger version of what my new technology expos were and, um, and went forward with that. But honestly, just the opportunities that I've had, um, just kind of fall into place along the way, um, you know, really shaped my thinking and, and both, you know, around how technology can help enable any business to do something um, as long as you're a not afraid. So that kind of harkens back to the, the space that are don't be afraid, you, you figure it out, we can make it work. Um, and, and allow creativity to be part of the conversation. And it's that, you know, you don't always have to do what everybody else is doing. Anyway, so um, yeah, just just so folks understand the scale. Now, you're referring to a time before you and I inter intersected, yeah. and I saw the soundstage, right? So, right. or the 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 setup that Andy's referring to grew into, and I suspect it was pretty spectacular at the beginning, but it got even more spectacular, uh, as they say in Polk County, uh, as it got longer. And the first one that I saw, I walked into the soundstage, and the team—I don't know what team—had built the fuselage of a plane and a beach within here. So the, the, to his point, the executives would come through and you didn't pitch them with a PowerPoint, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't pitch them with handouts. You walked them through an immersive experience. Well, it, it, it was what theatrical. We, and what we had learned from my previous NTG forums was context matters, right? Mm -hmm. The point was you can talk about, you know, if, if you, if you don't have a concept of what, technology can do and somebody gives you a PowerPoint and say, Hey, we can, you know, drive your sales up or whatever. That's a level of understanding when you can go see it and experience and see for yourself, Holy crap, this is, this is amazing. Um, that's a whole different understanding of where value can be driven or how you might dramatically change, um, change your business, your, your, you know, whatever it, it is just a way of communicating in context. And it's, and it's one of those things where when you're taking uh, technology and moving it from a cost reducer, which is its primary function for the longest time, yeah. into a revenue enhancement model, right? One of those two things has, you know, uh, a limit approaching zero. You can only reduce cost to zero. But revenue can increase without bound. If you can create an experience that's immersive and transformational that someone's never had before, you can literally create money trees for the company that are not dirty. This is, you know, some some people hear that in Bristol and be like, oh, capitalist this and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. This is about creating experiences that people didn't think they could have at a pace at which they didn't think was possible. People will gladly exchange their currency for that because those experiences yeah. are, are priceless. Yeah. And you guys lived in the world of priceless and really were one of the, the driving factors behind it. It's, it's spread significantly now to many companies, which is fantastic. But really, you were at the epicenter of that at Disney. And the Magic Band and all of the projects that are adjacent to the Magic Band really, I think, is almost like ground zero for a bunch of these transformational pieces. Yeah, I think I think the, the idea there is... Um, you know, people people are happy to pay if you make it easy and you make it something they want, and they're happy to to you know give their money to you to go forward. That, to me, that's the best experience, or best thing you can do as a technologist is you've made it easy, you made it fun, you made it uh, you know something spectacular. And the WDI teams, um, you know, with their storytelling ability and 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 to leverage technology to just make waiting in line uh, an awesome experience was amazing right they thought about it in in using game theory they they brought in some some really 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 good people that um that knew how to build games and turned in dead spaces and dead times um through technology you know my job was to build the core kind of underpinnings to allow these things to happen you know so there are very technologists out there but in, in the way Walt Disney works is WDI is the team that's dedicated to telling the stories. I was on the IT side. IT was there to build the capabilities and then the enablers. And that's how I've always kind of looked at my role um, within IT is I want to be an enabler to make people do, uh, allow people to do great things. And by the way, that's my leadership. Um, 
um, mentality is I want to be the enabler to allow my teams to do go go do great things, right? If I can remove roadblocks, if I can, um, you know, teach um, them to to look at things in a different way, um, I'm I'm an enabler. So um, you know, thank you for the uh, WDI and engineering group. Um, they want to tell stories. Then they use amazing technologies and inventions along the way to go do that. I wanted to be an enabler for them. And so my team kind of became the bridge between um, Walt Disney Imagineering and the real, the parks and the, how parks operate. And we kind of helped build um, the bridges between them. And that was one of the things that I, that IT could help with innovation on is we don't have to, we didn't have to be the innovator, but we, we were the enabler for the innovation to occur in our business and in uh, Imagineering at Disney. Well, and it, it's an interesting juxtaposition because it used to be Technology would come to the boardroom and say, we can do these six things. Which of these would you like to do? Right. Our budget will allow us to do four. Right? <laughs> Pick the four that you want. Right. And what this changed to was, um, hey, creatives, tell us the dream. What would you like to have happen? Don't worry about how. Don't worry if it's realistic. Don't worry about when. Don't. Uh, we don't care about any of that. And Imagineering, the Imagineering team is obviously great at that. Their heads in the skies are doing crazy stuff. Uh, and and driving tech innovation or experience transformation that way does allow the technology people to to really innovate and do cool things. But I want to I want to loop back to something you mentioned about the kind of leader that you want to be to eliminate roadblocks and to to empower to enable. These are the sort of buzzwords you think about with leadership. Can you give me like an example? And it doesn't have to be a Disney. It can be. We're we're sort of we started with the. Uh, you know, your rocket scientist days, and then we moved to your Disney days. I know we've got some other days around NASCAR and some days around Bank of America, and then now with Virgin Voyages. Can you pick a story from any of that sort of palette that is a good exemplar for how you remove roadblocks uh, for your team? Well, you know, uh, probably the most recent um, is here at Virgin Voyages. So, you know, we we built a company ground up, um, and built a team ground up. Um, so I was employee number 12 here and, um, and the IT guy. So I was doing everything for a while, but again, brought in a great team and my, my day to day job now, um, isn't, isn't actually doing anything specific other than making sure that if the team needs to move forward in a specific area, like, we need to launch the website or we need to refit a, a ship or we need to do whatever um, is I go make sure that they have all the information they need, that there's nobody waiting on decisions, that the materials and, and, and resources are available, that I've gotten the right money to make happen. That's all I do every single day is to make sure that I stay out of their way so that they can do, go do amazing things and that they have all the resources they need. And if a decision needs to be made, I get it made or I make it right and we move on. Um, and that what I've seen in the past is waiting on decisions, waiting on resources, waiting on the other person to do their job or getting clarity around this thing is what bogs everything down um, that happened, you know, in every place I've ever worked. And so I'm, I've, I've gotten to the opportunity where I can free up my my personal schedule enough that I have enough gaps in there that I can go make sure those things aren't happening to my team, which is a small but mighty team to go get a lot of stuff done because I've made sure that all those, those dumb things that happen kind of um, uh, uh, naturally or entropy, if you might call it um, happen, that I get those out of the way so they can go do amazing things. Cause we have an amazing team and, you know, we hire amazing people. We make sure that they're capable and smart and, and, and creative thinkers and innovators. Um, but sometimes they don't know how to, get the roadblock out of the way. And so stuff just stops and gets bogged down. I want, I'm, I've made it my goal in life at, here at Virgin Voyages to remove those roadblocks so that we can move quickly. Well, and, and just for the folks that are listening to the podcast and not watching the YouTube version of this, I've got Andy Schwab, uh, CTO, or is it CTO or CIO at Virgin Voyages? What's your I official actually do both jobs because I do think about them slightly separately. Fair. Um, um, so I'm the chief information officer. I'm the, you know, the guy who's making sure that we're doing all the right things from a corporate perspective. And, uh, I also am a technologist and help drive the thinking and strategy about how we go accomplish things, how we build things, 
and what things need to be linked together, you know, and what our data strategies are and that kind of stuff. Right. And so to, with that in mind, uh, the description you gave about uh, eliminating roadblocks and those things are super important and required for a leader at any or, you know, level of an organization, right, to empower their teams, however you choose to define empowering. But, but you do a lot more than that. I've witnessed you do a lot more than that. Not only participation in the, the brainstorming around the tech, around the vision, like that's fun stuff we can talk about. But you also are a very personal leader. And uh, one of your guys, Dave, damn it, Dave, uh, told me a story about a drone and how you handled a calamity with a very expensive drone early on. And and he thought it would be a great story for you to retell uh, on this on this broadcast because it made an impact to him. And you may well know that it made a big impact because you guys talk all the time. Maybe you don't, but I know that when he heard that you were going to be on the show, he's like, "You should get Dave or Andy to talk about the drone." Well, in order to have context for the drone story, you need to go back to when I was a child, and this is the way my mother raised me. So. Um, I, I grew up on a horse farm and um, English versus Western. So those may, may, may or may not know that, but a Western saddle has a little horn so you can wrap the, the rope around it and wrangle the cows. An English saddle does not. Um, and it's used for, and, and I grew up on a, a horse farm that had hunters and what they call hunters and jumpers and uh, they don't have horns, but I like the Western saddle because I could hold on as a child and it was easier to get on and off. And so I wanted to learn how to jump horses. And my, um, so I sat up on the Western saddle and my mom said, well, you, you probably don't want to jump a horse sitting on a Western saddle. So the, the, the <laughs> horse is right there, right between your legs. And uh, I said, why? She goes, well, jump and you'll find out. And so <laughs> that's, that's a core tenant to my, to my <laughs> teaching methodology, um, which is, well, I learned, I, 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 it was, it was the cost of tuition to learn that what happens when you jump, you slide forward, when you slide forward, well, the horn is right there. And so, um, you know, when the, when, when my boys, um, wanted to understand, you know, um, don't touch here because that's hot. I'm like, well, if you, you touch there, you'll learn what hot is. <laughs> and yeah. so, um, and so, you know, Dave, Dave um, had, we had this very expensive at the time. This when drones were relatively new um, and taking it home and was, was learning how to fly it. He was going to get his, or I think he did end up getting his FCC license or whatever to, to fly the drone. And um, um, he, he crashed it and, um, <laughs> and did, you know, not doing something quite right, but I'm like, well, you learned, you learned what not to do there again. We'll go, we'll get it fixed. And, um, um, but you, you now know that this is the way you should handle it. This is what you shouldn't do there. Um, same, you know, by the way, that same drone also by another person at Virgin Voyage took it on the ship and, um, realized that drones, um, use GPS for their landing and Oops. ships move. And so, um, when he set it in landing mode, it went into the ocean we ever saw that drone again but um it landed yeah it did it did <laughs> but the ship just wasn't there at the time <laughs> and so um you know i'm i'm of the ilk that um and and frank a mutual friend of derek's and mine uh coined this term at least i first i had heard of it and so i use it so i'm going to give frank credit for it but it's the cost of tuition at that point um and as and as long as it's in, in my mind as long as we've learned something and that we now know what not to do, um, we can then move forward and do better the next time. And that is a core philosophy that I, you know, I, I, I think people, people who know me um, have seen me use, but my children understand that <laughs> clearly. And uh, it is, it is, learning is important and there's lots of ways to learn. The, the only thing that ever frustrates me is when you don't learn right? You do it and you, and you didn't get anything out of it and, and figure out what, how to do something better the next time. Um, all I ask is that you figure out what it is that we learned and share it with everybody so that they don't have to learn the same mistake. Well, it was, it was interesting when Dave told the story. I don't know. I, it was a couple of weeks ago now. I want to say he had been an employee for like four and a half minutes. Now he had known you, I think, beforehand. And so he had severe fear 
uncertainty and doubt as to what was going to befall him when it was discovered that he had damaged this extremely expensive drone. And so your handling it the way you did, did a lot from a leadership perspective, right? To show support for him, to show that you believed in this cost of tuition, uh, the, the Frankism that you, you yeah. referred to it as. Uh, Frank is notorious, and, and hopefully we'll have Frank on a future episode of this because he's got tons of great stories as well. Um, but he is a much softer communicator than I am. And, and the way I typically couch this is I have no problem with ignorance because ignorance is a temporary state that can be corrected by education. Yeah, I do have a problem with stupid, right? And stupid is just retaining your ignorance and ignoring education. So if you learn a lesson, that's great. And like you just said, if you can teach that lesson to others so they don't have to learn it, the credits required are not the same, right? You don't have to sacrifice 20 drones. One guy dropping the drone in the ocean because GPS matters was sufficient or one guy, girl, I don't know. Um, so, so that being said, like this leadership mentality that you've got and you, you've brought back this sort of story of your mother. And I didn't know the story of, of the horses, interestingly enough. Uh, but, uh, but how have you seen your leadership style evolve over time? Like you, you've, you've been at this for a couple of years now, Andy, those, those who aren't looking on video, they, they're going to be, uh, you know, tricked by your youthful, uh, voice, but you've got a couple of, a couple of miles to tread on these tires. Have you seen things uh, change significantly since your early days? Um, you know, with with uh, the the rocket science group, and and all the way to now at Virgin Voyages, which is a very different cultural corporation. Uh, it is so. Uh, it, you know, I've been blessed with mostly all great uh, leaders um, as I grew up, and, and <laughs> except for that one person. <laughs> no, well, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. I didn't, I didn't say mostly, um, <laughs> but oftentimes, you know, and I'm a, I'm a I'm I'm somewhat in, introspective. I'm not nearly as introspective as Frank is, but. Um, you know, I, I often ask, and when I watch these leaders, I'm like, wow, am I doing this wrong? Like, this just doesn't feel right to me, but they're successful. So maybe, maybe I need to learn to be more of a jerk or something, um, you know, to get people to do what I, what I need to do. And I, you know, I, I, I think I realized that, um, that's just not me. So me personally, as a human being, um, and that it's way easier to be the same human being and be the human being that you that you are all the time, and whether it's at work or at home or or um, with friends, it is it is to, it is it is important and easier. I think um, that you are who you are, and um, you know I had great examples. My you know my parents, and and then as I mentioned, Brandy Brooks, and um, just people along the way uh, that taught me. How to how that it's that it's okay to be who you are. That everybody's going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, I did I did learn that. By the way, I expect that same level of authenticity from the people that work for me. Um, that you, that my way of interacting with them has to be unique on a one to one basis to each one of them because they're they're individuals. Um, so I think I think being who you are, um, being genuine in in how you respond um you know i'm always in a in a mentorship mode which is i want them to learn from good bad and the ugly um i want them to grow as a human being the the greatest success i have in my career um isn't all the stuff i've done but it's seeing all the people who have grown and um and gone on to do bigger and better things and and live their best life um, if I helped with that in any way, shape or form, then I would, then I am successful. And that's really how I measure myself, um, is, is then, and by the way, the same thing with my, with my three boys, um, you know, they've gone on to do wonderful things and are growing and are, are better examples of me than, than I ever hoped to be, but they're, they're then going to have children that go on and do great things. And, um, you know, I've had a, a small wave of an impact that's going to continue to grow. It's, it's interesting when you think about the different yeah. archetypes, whether it's uh, parental, which you ended on, uh, leadership, coaching, uh, whether it's sports or uh, arts, the people that influence, uh, they can be peers. We, you know, it's just as easy to be influenced by a peer, a collaborator, a teammate, uh, as it is to be uh, influenced by someone who has an official position of leadership. Right. Um, uh, that's one of the 
you know, significant differences between management and leadership. Management is sort of ordained or dictated. Leadership just right. happens. People just lead and some people just follow leaders. And that's the way it works sometimes. And sometimes you juxtapose those, you flip them. Um, but it's funny in, in, in the NFL or in coaching, you think about coaching trees, right? And coaches that have massive impact to their staff, their staff goes on. The Walsh coaching tree was one of the ones I talked about for years, right? And so uh, in leadership, the Disney uh, Next Gen Experience team has gone off to the four corners of the world and done incredible things, right? And you just hope that you're part of those things uh, in, in a forward perspective. And and with that in mind, let's 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 delve back into some of your experience. Like we we talked a little bit about Disney. I know there's a lot at Disney. We could probably do hours just on Disney between Magic Band and all the other pieces. And I'm fine for you to talk about anything. But you also spent some time at NASCAR, which I know exactly nothing about, except for its cars, right? And growing up in Auburndale, everyone liked it. So yeah. tell me a little bit about how you innovated in NASCAR. Well, a fascinating place. So um, you know, NASCAR, very old school, been around. I uh, became into their into their um, strength in the 70s, family run, um, and and really had some very core philosophies that were somewhat anti technical uh, or technology. In that, it's hard to believe. Well, it, in that, you know, if you look at at other competing race circuits like F1 and some others, technology is the is is in the forefront. They're pulling data off the cars and doing all kinds of things. NASCAR's goal really was their core uh, tenant anyway, was uh, equality so that you didn't have to spend a lot of money to compete against guys who had a lot of money so that you could get a wide variety of people in a, in a competition of 42 cars. And so they worked very hard to make sure that there was, there was equal capabilities within the cars. Um, and that's where technology actually came into play is, um, is, is measuring the cars, making sure that no one was cheating, but that they were doing all things uh, the same way throughout the, the racing process and that nobody was getting additional data off there. Because if you had a lot of money, you get a lot of data, then you'd have this team of scientists going off and figuring out how to do things differently. And the, and the poor guy down the road who wanted to also compete couldn't afford to do that. So that was part of the tension ish with technology. Um, so where we did innovate was, okay, so how do you help technology connect with the fan base? Or I mean, the race connect with the fan base. And so working with, with some of the in-car technology um, groups, so they had an, uh, a racing division on, to get some data off so that they'd have great scoring on the screen or that you could use that data and pull it into a gaming platform so that the games actually operated like um, the real driver. So they pull actual race data um, from uh, from one of the racers, whether it was Jimmy Johnson or somebody. And um, the AI car, when you play NASCAR, drives like Jimmy Johnson because they actually used real data from, from the racetrack to go do that. Um, we also, as social media started to have a real impact on NASCAR, um, wanted to give NASCAR insights as to what they did um, and how their sentiment was out there and what is going on in the world. So um, we partnered with HP at the time to develop a, a, a social media listening center that would actually pull in data, use a little bit of AI to understand sentiment and look at you know how things are going and how they're reacting. Um, some of the other parts that, that technology played a key role in NASCAR was um, in the broadcast side. So NASCAR had a state-of-the-art digital broadcasting facility in Charlotte that, um, and this was early in the days and kind of leading the industry, um, I mean, broadcast industry, not just race car or sports, on a full digital end-to-end -end process. That, you know, that was relatively new. Um, and so I helped make that better. I certainly didn't develop that in any way, shape, or form. But, um, you know, it was helping kind of drive those kind of agendas forward, help them think about how to connect with their fans in a better way, um, how to leverage technology to ensure um, there was um, uniformity. One of the projects that our team helped drive was um, using lasers to measure the car as opposed to physically measuring them so that they could get a, ensure the car was built in the exact specifications it was supposed to be built. So there's just a variety of things like that, that, that technology played a role in. And, uh, 
Now, along with the standard corporate things that any company has to deal with, whether it's, you know, an ERP platform and all that kind of stuff. Another big one was getting connectivity out to the track. So sure. um, as technology became more and more impactful um, in the industry, um, connectivity became critical. And uh, a lot of these tracks are out in the middle of nowhere. And they're only used a couple times a year. So getting a, getting a mechanism that allowed them to have good connectivity in a consistent manager that they could count on from uh, race to race because they travel all over the country. And this these trucks um, drive 25, you know, big semis every track just full of technology. Um, how to make that better. And it, it could lower costs. It could enable, you know, new capabilities. You could do remote diagnostics, all those kinds of things that you can get with good connectivity. Um, you know, that was a big program that we worked on and developed. So, you know, a variety so of you, things. You, you went from two very tech forward, tech centric organizations to NASCAR, which I would not have couched as such. Now, when you got to NASCAR, was it was that the direction? Is that why you were brought to NASCAR? Was to help yeah. uh, enable and enhance that, or or yeah, I think I think they there? realized that that technology was was an, was had implications, and they wanted somebody with a broad understanding of technology. And you know, with my engineering background, with my IT hmm. background, with my experience background, um, you know, I could have an impact on helping. You know, as they were launching a new website and. Um, all those kinds of things. I could help with that. I could help with the R and D side. I could help with uh, engaging with with fans in the theme parks, or I mean, in the racetracks. Um, so you know, we tried to just kind of dabble around that space uh, as much as possible. I left there after two and a half, three years because it was every weekend I was at a racetrack and it was just wearing me out. So um, you know, I ended up uh, leaving there to go to Bank of America. Well, that sounds like a hell of a gear shift. <laughs> right. So tech, 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 experience, 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 banking. How, yeah, so, how did that happen? So it was interesting. You know, I, I asked them like, why, why are you interested in me? <laughs> yeah. Like I have a, I've had a checking account. That's, you know, the extent of my financial uh, fintech. And it was funny because the CIO for Bank of America at the time uh, of the consumer bank, um, Bank of America is huge. There's like a 200,000 pe people in, in IT. But this was the the um, lady who was in charge of, of uh, consumer banking um, said, we specifically wanted somebody not from FinTech uh, to come in here and help us think through how we improve the experience in the banks. Um, that's the place people come. Um, and we, d we don't need you to have FinTech understanding. We need you to come in and think differently for us. And so I'm like, well, I guarantee I'll think differently because I don't know anything about fintech. Um, so I came in there and um, helped help develop um, some programs around and innovate, right? We started playing with Bluetooth beaconing and, and things like that, tablets um, for, for bankers on how to interact with customers that came in the bank as they you know, the banking is going through a, a, a transition. You know, the online thing is kind of sort of happening and most banking is done, is shifting, right? You, it, at the time, it was um, everybody walked in the bank and cashed a check and walked away with cash kind of mentality. They're trying to get out of that and really uh, have the banking centers more focused on the high value interactions that need to happen for investments and things like that, loans, um, whatever. They, they, the, low level transaction they wanted to get out of the out of the bank um, and allow people to do that online well there's some things it's really hard to do online like get cash <laughs> yeah so, definitely complex right so uh you know atm's been around forever and so one of the things that that they had started innovating on is well what if you put a teller in a call center and if you walked up to an atm um they could do a lot of things for you um and we didn't actually have to have a bunch of people out in uh, each of the branches. We could actually control that in a centralized area. And they had a way to remotely control and unlock some abilities with the ATMs that you you didn't have to go into the bank for anymore. And so, um, you know, it was it was really a, a kind of a transitionary period for for banking in that um, they were they didn't get is interest rates dropped and all those kinds of things. That's where banks make all their money is on the uh, yield arbitrage 
um, for interest rates. So they were trying to drop their fees and their costs and all that kind of stuff and then make sure the banks were there to ensure the high value interactions. So let's take out these low value interactions and allow people to do that with their ATM. So I helped them kind of think through that and deploy um, ATMs that you could go up and get, you know, $10,000 in cash if you had to, or um, I don't have my ATM card, but I have my driver's license. Can I get some money, please? Um, that kind of stuff that you would normally have had to go to a bank previously right. you didn't have to anymore. And so um, we also had played with the ability. So when somebody walked into the bank, um, the your phone would beacon uh, in, if you were um, somebody who had an appointment that you'd already show up on the tablet, they'd greet you with a, a tablet so that, that they can now service you and send you to the right person and make that a, a more effective and efficient interaction within the banks. So that, those are the kind of things I helped with and helped them think through and, and help develop a strategy for. Well, it, it's interesting. Banking is something we all have to interface with. And, it, you know, the language you chose to use, like uh, eliminate the low value transactions to focus on the high value transactions. That's certainly one lens with which one could look at it. The other one is enable the people who are doing transactions to do them in a more efficient, uh, yeah. you know, do the business where they're at, right? No one really wanted to go into the bank right. to do something simple. They wanted to get the thing. What is the thing I wanted? Is it cash? Is it to drop off coins? Is you know, Do I need a, a bank check? What, what do I need? What's the most rapid way I can get that and not be inconvenienced? Now, banking has continued to either evolve or devolve, depending on your perspective, because we had the tellers you were talking about literally right down the street. They had the cool... It was like a Skype session. They could come in and do a, yeah. a virtual teller uh, while you sat in your car, annoying the person behind you because you were doing multiple transactions. It's like the person who goes to Starbucks and orders 73 drinks. But now they've closed all those branches and to go to a, a, a branch is not, not a thing. But I didn't know that you had played with beacons uh, at Bank of America. I had never experienced that at our Bank of America, um, but it's, it's fascinating. I, I didn't think it ever, actually ever became real. Um, uh, it was one of those things that... Um, I think was the art of the possible and we demonstrated, sure. you know, that, Hey, this could help. Um, you know, they banking is going through a lot. And I think bank of America, uh, all the banks, not, I'm not picking on bank of America or anything, um, are struggling with where they add value and where they, you know, uh, can become profitable. Um, I think, I think in general that, uh, what I found at least in, in the industry is, people who work in banks have always worked in banks and they've never done anything else. <laughs> and um, it, it is very much a, a banking mentality in that people were shocked when I told them what my background was. They're like, no one does that. Right. Everybody who works in a bank has always been in banking. Right. Uh, so it was, it, it was hard to move the needle much there. I actually have a, a patent um, that I developed while there. Um, I, they were really good to me. And, you know, so I, I have nothing but love for Bank of America. They sent me to a, um, a multi-week program at, at uh, one of the business schools to to learn kind of banking, I guess. And um, one of the one of the things there was to develop a presentation, and then present it. Um, I ended up uh, my team, uh, but I presented it and, and wrote it basically um, won the one the week or the two week thing there. But anyway, out, out of that came a patent, which was the ability to um, have a credit card where you could use the fraud engines to set rules that you could change as a parent or as a guardian of somebody. And you could you could turn on um, spend limits and, and category limits so that you could say you could spend fifty dollars on groceries and twenty dollars on gas. Um, but, th but that's it. And so you had actual controls. Well, the bank had all the rails necessary to enable that be through their fraud engines because they know exactly what transactions are, who the merchant type was, and what you're spending against. And so um, I helped write, I wrote a patent that um, allows them to do that. I, I, to, to date, I'm not sure they've actually implemented much of it, but it was a, it was an interesting idea that would solve some need out there. Yeah. I mean, the, the dynamic control of budgeting is something we've talked about experientially in a bunch of different areas. Now that's tying it directly to the, the, the bank card. Uh, in, in my past lives, we talked about it with regards to your, like it, it could be your ID to get into Disney or to get into any sort of an event, Bush gardens. You, as soon as you create an account or a folio, you can create rules around how that folio can be accessed. And if you have hierarchy in the folio where you have 
parents or guardians and then and then children you can certainly have cascading sets of rules that apply and and really interesting things like conditional approvals and conditional two-factor authorization based on spend like and so for people who aren't technologists like what the hell are these guys babbling about well what it means is i can set it up so that my son nicholas who's just now 18 can send, spend a certain amount if we go on one of your wonderful virgin voyages cruises because now he's old enough to go I, I could make sure that he could only spend a certain amount and not get in trouble, even though almost everything is included in, in Virgin Voyages, right? So it's sort of a perverse example. Or imagine I'm on some other event and I have on my credit card, if I spend more than $1,000, I want a secondary authorization, right? So that if someone grabs my card and goes and does bottle service somewhere, that gets caught. These are things you can put in place that protect people from themselves and protect them themselves, which is really, really cool stuff. So yeah. it's it's neat that you were able to do fun stuff at a bank because I sure as hell wouldn't have been able to think of anything fun at a bank. <laughs> well, honestly, you know, out of real world, uh, you know, inventions of mother or mother, of, you know, necessities, mother of inventions um, was both. I had a child in college um, that I, need, I was thinking, of how could I ma help manage his spending? And my parents were actually uh, taking care of somebody who who had a little bit of dementia and was making purchases in the middle of the night. And so, oh um, you know, it was it was those kind of real world examples that I thought, you know, now that I understand how how the transaction flow actually, uh, yeah, laziness is probably a better term, uh, <laughs> how the how the flow works within a bank, I, I realized that well, we have all the tools that are necessary to make this a reality. All you need is a UI, to, and then. Um, the Bank of America recently just built out a really nifty uh, fraud detection system that every transaction goes through this and a set of rules are applied to that. Just broaden the set of rules. And then now suddenly you've got this ability um, to to give a feature to a customer that might actually be willing to pay for it or at least make their lives better that they will bank with you as, as opposed to somebody else. So Yeah, it, it can help them. It can save them some pain. It can also save the bank some pain because many times this is on credit cards where the bank is going to uh, guarantee that you're not going to get left in the dark if someone does something, you know, some ne'er-do-well uh, triggers something, some cascading set of badness. Uh, a mildly funny side story, depending on your perspective. I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm actually royalty. Um, uh, during a, uh, I think they call it day drinking um, session many, many moons ago with a dear friend of mine we decided that we wanted to become uh, royalty. And there's a, a sovereign nation called Sealand, which is a yes uh, a platform off the coast of England, um, which you can buy your patents from. And so I, I am Lord Von Told You So, um, <laughs> which you know me well enough so that that makes sense. But, yeah. but in purchasing this, I was sitting at a place where you can get Jameson and probably having Jameson at the time. And I was trying to purchase this royalty from Sealand Bank of America didn't like that. So fraud alert came up. So I get the text message. I call in. Yes, this is me. I am, in fact, trying to spend money with a country called Sealand. Okay, well, I need you to prove that you're you. Okay. Well, I'm the one who got the message on the phone that's of record. I knew of the transaction. What else would you like? And I got to tell you, the number of questions, they were damn near wanting me to give a blood sample through the phone. Right. I, I was finally to the point where I'm like, I don't know what else I can do to convince you that I am me, <laughs> yeah. but I understood the spirit and intent that they were doing it. It probably didn't help that I had been drinking. Uh, but but I have been in India and had fraud protection save my bacon. Uh, so it's it's a very, very useful tool. But yeah. let's let's shift gears a little bit because now you are at uh, a company that I can attest to uh, from the periphery is incredibly innovative. Uh and they're in a space that while some of the, uh, you know, when people hear cruise, sometimes they think the love boat and they think about a bunch of old people floating around and drinking too many Mai Tais. And cruise is not that, folks. And Virgin Voyages is on the forefront of what it could be. And this isn't a commercial for Virgin. I own no stock in Virgin. In fact, I do no business with Virgin, but I am intimately familiar with it. And you and your team was a joy to work with and collaborate with and innovate with. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about some of the things you think are special that reflect on leadership, all the cool stuff that we talk about on this podcast uh, as it's scoped to Virgin Voyages. And you can do it in whatever format you want, factual, story, uh, okay. uh, limerick, uh, yeah. whatever whatever floats your boat. I, I don't think I'm creative enough for a limerick, but I, I have to give that some <laughs> There once was a man from Nantucket. Wait, exactly. no. 
Uh, so, it, you know, as I mentioned, I started back in 2015 all at Bank of America when as soon as I saw that Tom McAlpin was launching a new cruise line and I had mentioned that I had launched Disney Cruise Line where Tom was uh, at. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. A, I think cruising is awesome if it's quality and and B, I liked um, the startup mentality um, that we had then. And so I was looking to relive that again. Um, so I came down and, um, as I said, I was employee number 12, um, the single IT te technology person. Um, and so, you know, we started building a company at that point. Um, and I was blown away by the quality of people that they had hired, um, up to that point. Um, and <laughs> the other 11. The other 11. Yeah. Uh, yeah so, it was a solid 11. But, you know, it's, you know, the the, the design team, D. Cooper yeah. and, and Nathan Rosenberg, who's who's our CMO today, um, were just, just fantastic people. Nirmal, who's now our CEO, um, brightest person I know, um, you know, and I'm like, I, I, you know, I want to work with these people because this is really amazing. And, and by the way, you know, Richard Branson's involved, who I've always been an admirer of. So, and I'm launching a cruise line. So what, how better could it be? So, you know, we started that and, and, you know, I had been envisioning all the cool things I could do with technology, how could technology could enable the experience. But what I, what, what the team, Nathan, probably more than anybody um, was really focused on was how do we build a culture? And, and, you know, that really resonated with me because the, the times that we'd done amazing things, so I've had opportun multiple opportunities to do amazing things in my career, which is just fantastic, um, in, uh, both opportunity, is that we had a culture that drove um, amazing, uh, amazing things came out of that culture. Um, so when, when I formed the NTG group and the, and the people I pulled together, we had created a culture uh, within um, a larger culture that um, was just amazing. They, we, we, we did amazing things. And so the same thing happened um, here. And we were very prescriptive about the people we hired. The, the, the interview process that we did was to vet out how they would be additive to our culture and help it help expand our culture and our culture was intended to be authentic um you, you know as a person um transparent honest um um you know uh we, we have this thing called family creeds um we're supportive of each other there are no hidden agendas there are no um uh, uh fiefdoms being grown, um, and, and by the way, some of the past companies I've worked for—that's that's a way they do business, um, and we didn't want that here at Virgin Voyages. And so, um, building and focusing in on culture and being um, being in, um, making it uh, pur purposeful um, was a point. The other point that made this a great place is a, makes this a great place to be. And that's why we have a great product. And that's why I want to get to that point is we've created a great culture. Um, we've, we've, we've focused on and been and been very prescriptive and very um, uh, specific about how we want people to behave with each other and with our sailors, our, our guests um, is, and we've built programs around that and spent a lot of time and energy in helping you understand who we are as a company, who Virgin is as a company, um, and what it means to be part of our crew. We're all crew, whether we're on the ship, off the ship, we're all crew. Um, and that we're authentic, that we're, um, we can, we're free to be who we are. Um, but that means that you're a part of a family and that family looks out for each other. Um, the family may be, um, may be, tell you you're doing good or you're doing bad and this is how you get better but our goal is to be supportive transparent authentic um loving if you will um on how to create an environment that allows people to be happy with the way they are uh, because this by the way is also a tenant of the virgin uh, corporate uh, management group richard specifically says if you treat your employees well they'll treat your your customers well 
Um, and that is absolutely right. I've always agreed with that. I've always believed that if everybody's happy with what they're doing and feel like they're having an impact and can make a difference in somebody's life, they'll want to do that. So create those environments that, and opportunities for people to do that and great things will happen. We have the number one cruise line. We've been voted by pretty much everybody and their brother that this is this is um, a great experience because our crew is awesome. Again, something, you know, Tom, uh, myself, um, Michelle Bentubu, who's our COO, who I brought in um, from Bank of America. So she came to with me to Bank of America and then I brought her down from Bank of America to Virgin. Um, Frank Farrell on my team. We all came from Disney. One of the things that everybody always says about Disney is the cast. So our crew, their cast, um, um, is what makes the theme park a special place. We all believe in that. We all agree with that, that, that it is all about the people. And if the people are treated well, treated, um, it doesn't mean we have to be the, the highest paying or the whatever. We, we treat you like a human being. We treat you as a, as a person we care about. Um, that you'll go, you're, you're now enabled to go do new things. You're not dealing with um, pain or loss or whatever in the background. We're, we're trying to support you to be, to be awesome. Our crew on board our ships is what makes our ships fantastic. It's a great environment. We've built beautiful ships. Uh, we have great technology on the ships, um, but it's really the crew. It is all about the crew who are doing their jobs in a way that they, they love what they're doing and they're making a special uh, uh holiday vacation for our sailors um, in a way that is is unique. And therefore, we have a product that will become profitable and, um, you know, make our shareholders happy and, and, and grow um, as a business. But it isn't, that isn't how you start thinking about it. You think about it in terms of culture and crew and an environment to work and do great things. Okay, now those great things are we created a great cruise line. Uh, we created an environment that people want to be, whether you're a sailor or a crew person, that our goal was to, uh, and, and Nathan is the, a master at, at, at uh, coming up with these phrases, but an epic sea change for all, we, we want to make the world a better place as a result of us existing. Um, and so we have we have spent money and time on um, making um, ships cleaner um, from a, a pollution or CO2 perspective. We, we've, we've developed technologies and worked with companies to, to help drive those impacts down. We were a uh, wellness environment. The quality of our food is just because it tastes good and it's served in a beautiful way, but it's, it's good for you or, you know, maybe the ice cream isn't, but, you know, we... We have a restaurant dedicated that's vegetarian forward or, you know, we just want quality in everything that we do. We have exercise programs. We have uh, yoga classes. We have enrichment things going on along with all the fun stuff, right? You got to do the fun stuff along <laughs> with the things. Um, but we just wanted you to walk away at the end of your holiday. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm better because I, I came on Virgin Voyages. We want, by the way, the crew to say the same thing. By having worked or working for or continuing to work with Virgin Voyages, I'm a better person. You know, we 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 want them to learn and grow and evolve. You know, we're 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 rapidly, you know, bringing in younger, less experienced people and growing them into captains or growing them into general managers um, right. and giving them opportunities that they wouldn't have anywhere else in the planet. Um, and to me. That's why we exist. I mean, yes, we're going to exist to, to make money for our shareholders, but we're making an industry better. So, you know, we watch all, all our competitors who are now starting to do things uh, differently because we exist. And, and, you know, we're helping kind of help nudge and say, let's do the right thing together collectively. So there's a lot to unpack there uh, and, and a couple of observations. And, and they could be inaccurate, by the way. So you feel free to correct me. Uh, and it could be just recency bias that's doing this as well. But as much fun as you had working on uh, incredible technology as a young man and the incredible transformational technology you worked on at Disney and the teams you built there, uh, the work at NASCAR that was revolutionary in that industry, uh, the work in Bank of America, which literally helped you uh, protect your children's financial future, right? The discussion of this lit you up. 
right? You you are clearly excited about this, which is cool. And, and I can attest to it because I've been there. I've been beside you on these ships. I've been through some of these things with you. I've seen it. I've seen the culture. And I want to put in a couple of little statements here that we can feel free to riff on. Uh, our society has become incredibly cynical. And that's coming from a cynical jackass myself, right? Yeah. But when we say things like we create a corporate culture, you'll hear someone immediately say, there's no such thing as a corporate culture. You can't call your work family a family. It's not the same thing. Um, th that those things aren't real. Uh, but I've seen it. I I've seen another thread, and it's not just with you. You've seen it with others. I've seen it with myself. People who like to collaborate find ways to collaborate together repeatedly, right? You, you find your tribe and your tribe sort of moves around. They're not always uh, co-located at the same, you know, at the same time, but you've got Michelle, Frank, right? Tom, these people that all came from the cast days. Another thing I want to drop in is like, I'm going to drop a bunch of these things and I want you to be able to pick whichever ones you want to talk about. Your comment about the cast and that being a parallel to the crew and how it is tethered to how much ownership they both feel in the product. Yeah. Right. Um, you told a story about one of the things you did early on as a cast member at Disney, right? With the Jungle Cruise. Yeah. I was a Jungle Cruise skipper while I was in college, which yeah. is astonishing, but it's not a rarity. I was at a, and I, and I apologize, this, a friend of mine had been there for 25 years or 30 years and they do this big thing. And I think he received some sort of Mickey themed watch or something. It was yeah. really cool. And it was uh, like, probably 50, 60 people came for this thing. His first job at Disney was selling the Mickey ice creams. Yeah, That's how you build culture. So for anyone out here who says you can't build a dynamic, changing, transformational, impactful, difference-making culture, you're wrong. This is not an opinion. This is trivially true. That can be built, and it looks like you guys are building it there. It, 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 is, it has to be intentional. It has to be a choice. And it's and it's and it has to be a continual focus, because there are people we've hired that a, as time went on, either through pressure, change, or we missed it, weren't the right fit. And so sure. we've 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 said, look, thank you very much, but um, you're going to have to leave because we need we need somebody else in this role. Um, and it's not necessarily negative against them, but they were not the right fit from a culture perspective. And you know, we've we've worked very hard. And hold each, all the leaders, everybody accountable, but specifically it starts at the top, um, hold each other accountable. Um, one of the things that you don't do in a family, uh, so using that as a term, and I, and I know that's a dangerous term because you don't fire a family, but we do fire uh, employees at times, um, uh, is, is that we're very intentional about um, not creating a blame environment. So... Um, again, past lives, um, it was you were always worried about covering your ass because you might get blamed mm -hmm. for something. Sure. <clears throat> um, and again, we've really tried to to create an environment where if something's wrong, let's talk about it and then see how we do better. Um, and so, you know, there's audits that go on all the time and that's required by maritime law. Um, and we have findings and we all talk about those findings and it isn't about you did this wrong and you're going to be punished for it. It's about, okay, that wasn't right. Um, let's talk about how we do this better. What can we learn from this? Um, and then and then let's all work together to see that that's happening. And then when it happens, you go, good job. We, 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 we got this better. Thank you very much. Um, as opposed to, um, you know, we're going to dock your pay or beat you up or whatever. Um, that's never a good strategy to – for people or, or environment, but it's, it's making sure that as we grow and learn and, and do things that we, that we hold each other accountable to do the right things. And when we don't do the right things, we hold each other accountable. Let's talk about them. Let's do better. And let's move on. Um, and that's, and that's how we behave as a company. And I think that's where then people start actually feeling comfortable. I mean, you know, when we bring in people from other, um, uh, cruise lines, typically crew, there's a detox period sometimes that has to happen um, to come work at Virgin Voyagers. And same with people on my team uh, have come from other other areas, other companies where that wasn't the case. 
And so, you know, they built up a set of, of guardrails around them and are afraid to bring bad news or they're, um, they're always, you know, they're only going to keep themselves looking right here because right. they yelled at otherwise. Um, we're trying to create an environment where you look left, right, front, and back and make sure that if that person needs some help, you lean over, whether it's your job or not, um, to make sure that they're successful because if they're successful, we're successful. Um, and so that philosophy um, is held, you know, from Tom, uh, now Nirmal, um, all the senior leadership um, believe in that. And we work together to make sure that everybody is successful. Um, within IT, like, you know, we impact all parts of the business. Um, and we are not perfect, right? You know, we I always say we're about 80%. We're, we're working <laughs> on getting, getting to 90 to 100 but, um, you know, I make sure that as we're doing budgets and things like that, we're looking at, well, do we need more umbrellas or do we need another server uh, in the IT space? We, that's how we have to think, because um, as a company, we want the company to succeed. And, and, and it isn't just about IT. It isn't just about marketing. And so I'm constantly looking at how can I, I drive my costs down so that we can put more money in marketing so that people know about our product more. Um, because if they know about our product and actually get on and sale, they'll want to sale again and grow and, and our business will thrive. Um, so that's how all of us think, right? We're all trying to make sure that each person is successful. It isn't about one person being successful in the company. It's everybody. And if everybody's successful, then we win. Um, and you know, so, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I remember a story from many, 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 many moons ago uh, on the original crossing for Scarlet when uh, counts on a particular system that controls gangway, I wouldn't have to go into the details of it for folks who are not cruise centric. Suffice it to say, there's a way to track which souls are now the purview of the ship and which are on shore. And that's really, really, really important. And we were having all sorts of problems with that um, because it had been over-engineered to handle an incredibly complex corner case uh, that was not at all prevalent and had it arisen, it would have been really useful, but it didn't in the primary case was completely screwed. And so it was every embarkation was the counts were off and there's all sorts of cascading sets of calamity that occur. One of my favorite pictures is a picture of Tom McAlpin, CEO at the time of, of Virgin Voyages with a group of people that worked under my control who were working on that with a zero count, the first zero count where it was accurate. And it spoke to the partnership that existed and the fact that the CEO was down in the belly of the beast, yep. not different than when we were in the belly of the beast on the crossing initially uh, making things work. It truly is uh, fascinating. I've got one more uh, bone to pick with a uh, prevailing sentiment uh, driven, I think, primarily by social media, which I have grown to test more and more with each passing moment. Yeah, The concept that things are either that they're a binary, that they're either all good or all bad. And so there are a lot of people that will look down their nose at Cruise. You made a comment about how Virgin Voyages, and this is not a commercial for Virgin. Again, I've got Andy Schwab, CIO and CTO of Virgin Voyages, but this is more of an overarching comment. You guys are making cruising better. You're making it better for the environment. You're making it better for the sailors. You're making it better for the, for the crew. That doesn't mean it is all the way better. And, and just because you made it 18% better, right? That's still better. That moves the needle. I don't know when our society got to the point where a, a billionaire can donate a hundred million dollars and be scoffed at for donating a hundred million dollars. Right. But for the love of all that is good and holy, please pull your heads out of your collective asses and realize that that is still good. Yeah. It is goodness. Could it be better? Yeah. Sure. Everything can be better almost all the time. So uh, kudos to what you guys are doing at Virgin, and I want to and I want to be mindful of your time as well. I know we're over an hour already, but I want to I want to twist it a little bit. We've now covered all the way back to the the foundation of agile technology or agile methodology. We've gone through a bunch of different things. We didn't spend nearly enough time talking about Jameson yet or uh, smoking yeah. briskets. Um, so there's always a chance for that to creep into the end here. But let's talk about challenges. Think about that entire greater than 15 years experience you have. Um, can you give me a story of one of the biggest challenges that you faced um, and how you overcame it uh, with regards to leadership? Uh, well, both of them were launching a cruise line, Disney Cruise Line and Virgin, are probably the two biggest challenging, well, uh, Space Center was pretty challenging at times, especially after the Challenger accident. 
Um, wow, I didn't even think about you being present during that. Yeah, I was actually the the uh, electrical engineer meant to go on site and was 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 there monitoring it when. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, when there was a wow. it says we've lost downlink, um, and I looked outside and I could see the SRB you smoke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going in direction. I was also on the uh, investigation committee um, uh, to find out what happened. So that was wow. challenging in of itself. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about a little happier things. But launching a cruise line was really tough, um, and it was really so Disney. Um, we were behind schedule as often are the case um, and we <laughs> sold, sold the cruise and, you know, you got to launch on time. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it is, is behind. We, you know, didn't have great requirements, didn't understand the requirements and, you know, we're building this thing called a property management system with a company called Fidelio. And, um, you know, it went on to become the industry standard and everybody uses it. It's, all, all great. But, um, you know, we were trying to do things that hadn't happened in the past and um, uh, hadn't been done before. And so we, we um, had wanted to change the way gratuities were done. And so we'd worked with, with Fidelio to develop a new way to do recruit uh, uh, gratuities. And, it was so different that the that the company at the time didn't really want to do it, um, and so we had to really fight to get that done. It was a high pressure environment. We were about to have passengers on board, and the system wasn't quite ready, and it was just all going on. And my job really at that point shifted from the problem solver to keeping everybody sane and and um, and focusing on the humans as opposed to the technical challenges. And I think at that point, I learned that that's the more important path than it is to solve the technical challenge, whether we solve gratuities or we made the system work or not. It was making sure my team felt supported, that they um, that they knew that it was going to be okay, that we were going to figure this out, um, calming people down. Um, and even our business partners who were, hair was on fire, they were, you know, swinging from the chandeliers kind of thing. And it was, it was, it was really look, look, okay, here's what we got to go do. We, we, need, we need to figure this out. Let's be mindful about what the impacts are going to be and we'll solve this. And um, you know, it was a highly stressful environment, but um, once the people kind of took a breath and understood that it was going to be okay, we solved the problems and Disney's gone on to be one of the better cruise lines out there. But, you know, putting, you know, putting pre additional pressure on people, yelling at people, point, you know, whatever in the way to solve the problem. Solve the problem is let's get people um, focused again, take a deep breath. It'll be OK. We'll, we'll make it there from here um, is key. And so as a leader, um, your job is to look out for the well-being of your team and your team needs to understand that you've got their back. And if you if they feel like you've got your back. Um, then as problems arise, then they have the confidence to potentially lean out a little bit, stick their neck out, apply a little bit of risk if necessary to get the job done. Where if you're, if you don't feel like you're supported and understood, then any risk is, is too hard and too scary. And I don't know how to think about it. And you can't think clearly and uh, you're in fight or flight mode all the time. Um, and, things just go down from there. And it was, it was through, I was being supported by my leadership, um, you know, at the time, and I was able to provide that level of support to the team. I think that's the key to, to, to overcoming difficult situations is to be mindful of the human, uh, both people yelling at you because they need this thing. Okay. I understand what you need. Here's what we need to do about that. Um, I'm sorry, this isn't right. Um, here's what we're doing about that. Um, I'll let you know how it's going, um, you know, versus, you know, shouting back at them or saying it's their fault because they didn't give me good requirements, whatever. That's not helpful right. at that point in time. And same thing with my team trying to deliver is yeah, understood. OK, let's go figure this out together and and, and we'll do that. So it, it really is about the people um, more. than It's it's interesting the way you focused on the support of the people in empowering, supporting and enabling them to take risk. Because if you look 
at how problems get solved, at least problems that are significant. Like basic blocking and tackling just happens, right? That's not the end of the world. You figure it out, right? But when you are confronted with true dilemma, with with show-stopping issues in production, right? You need your team to be willing to think, and I hate trite aphorisms like outside the box or whatever, but they're 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 there for a reason, right? Um, they have to feel as though they can take some risk in order to solve things in innovative ways, creative ways. Because it, like you said, if, if they don't, then they're just going to try and do the basic stuff they could do. And that is just not the way to get things done. Right. So, um, Looking towards the future, we, we, we hinted it, we teased it. Um, how do you think the CIO CTOs of the future should be looking uh, towards AI, machine learning, these sorts of things. Like, how would you tell a 22 year old version of Andy to, to look at uh, what's what's facing them uh, in technology? You know, I so I can tell you my my thoughts on 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 AI today. Um, certainly, is exactly how. I was there for kind of the the beginnings of the internet, the thing called the internet. Um, and the feeling of the implications it's going to have, not knowing what they all were or understanding what all those are, but I know enough now to say that, you know, where AI is coming, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. There's going to be a lot of hype that's going to fall fall short. There's going to be a lot of um, uh, promises that, that will fall short. There's going to be a lot of, uh, people trying to figure out how to make money on this that don't make that doesn't make any sense is I would say trust your instincts, um, Andy at 22 years old, uh, <laughs> and 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 if it seems if it doesn't make sense to you it probably doesn't and and or <clears throat> be mindful that things will evolve pretty rapidly um, and then go stale for a while and evolve even more rapidly as as uh, critical mass starts taking if, impact. And, and watch for those opportunities. Um, so what I'm taking on from an AI perspective today, I'm personally interested in it. I've been interested in it since um, neural net development was a thing back at the Space Center. We were, you know, writing code to do stuff. But um, is is educate yourself as much as possible. Figure out where the, where the inflection points are. And don't buy into all the hype, but listen. And you know, and, and learn, and be 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 somewhat skeptical, but not overly skeptical. Because I've also seen, you know, where people, um, you know, are overly skeptical because they can't envision what the world might be like differently. Know that you don't know that, right? So, to me, wisdom is all about knowing what you don't know, uh, knowing that you don't know everything, right? You you, you know, it it is it is one of those things that I try and and teach my kids is, you know, one of the things that that colleges often do for you is it is about what you learn in college it's the fact that you learn holy shit there's a whole bunch of stuff that i didn't know anything about before um yep. you know and, and so now you know that you don't know everything um that opens your mind up to the possibilities that there's stuff out there you don't know um and so the same thing is true about any any i think revolutionary technology or technology that's going to have a huge societal impact um which i do believe is ai at this point um and you know, that's the cloud term that I've always hated as well. It's just this broad general term that makes it easy for yeah. people to grasp onto. But, you know, the ability for, um, you know, LLMs or, or whatever it is, and whether we hit AGI or not, but is to have things that are linked together in ways that that are not possible from a human consciousness perspective um, being presented to you and, and present you either information in ways that you never thought of before or, um, ability to troll through large amounts of information and create a summary that's succinct for us to understand as human beings are really valuable tools. And if we can actually get there, we can start making better decisions, have better insights about what it is we're trying to accomplish. We can uh, eliminate mundane tasks, uh, potentially. We can collaborate and communicate more effectively across the board. You know, a lot of uh, uh, people are leveraging, you know, ChatGPT and some of those tools. To, to write better. It isn't that they're not trying to present their own ideas, but they're doing it in a way that might be easier consumed by somebody else. That can have a profound impact, right? If I'm the most brilliant man on the, on the planet, but I, I can 
communicate like shit, um, then my brilliance is going to have zero impact on society or, or the world or anybody. Um, but if I communicate well and in a way that's consumable by a large audience, wow, that just unlocks a bunch of things. Just like the Internet's done allowing people like my friend Derek to have a podcast um, without spending, a, you know, $10,000 on a studio and, and, and all that. These tools have enabled uh, people to have a window into the world and have an impact that they wouldn't otherwise have normally gotten through through past lives. AI, I think, may unlock some of that for us. And so that's the kind of stuff I'm, I would want anybody to start thinking about. I, everything that everybody's promising isn't going to be true for a while or ever. Um, but but keep your mind open that there's some stuff you don't know yet. So be, be mindful of that. Well, the the awareness of what you don't know, I think, is certainly important. Um, and a couple of uh, just catch ups on the acronyms. You and I come from the world of acronyms, LLM, large language models, which is the backing to most artificial intelligence. Essentially, it consumes a bunch of data and then draws patterns from the data. And from those patterns, it can then deduce other things and answer questions. You dropped AGI, which is a, a good and not subtle differentiator from AI, artificial intelligence versus artificial general intelligence one being narrow cast, one being broad based. Uh, if I could teach an AI how to play chess, that doesn't mean it can play Go. Um, and so having a, an AI who becomes an AGI and can learn other things or can extrapolate from the knowledge that it has acquired by whatever means it has acquired it and then drive onto other things um, becomes super powerful. That's why you have a lot of folks out there, very, very smart folks, very, very concerned about what happens when that bit is flipped because computational analysis has already surpassed humans' abilities, right? right. As, a, as a single purpose AI, they can always be better than an individual person right now because they have essentially limitless capacity for processing and limitless capacity for storage. We don't have either of those things in this hunk of meat between our ears, as my friend Sam Harris would say. So uh, the, the, the danger becomes what happens when they get better at the other stuff and that's if you're in the danger camp. I'm not necessarily in the danger camp. And there's a lot of really fascinating conversations that we could spend a lot of time talking about in that camp. What I am becoming more and more interested in as of late is what happens when all of these jobs, like when we automated assembly lines, it was like, well, mundane tasks are going away. Uh, those folks are now freed up to do harder things that really require smarter humans to be doing it. We keep raising that bar. At some point, we run out of things for the humans to do, right? Which not necessarily the end of the world, except for we do have a model by which people are compensated for the things they do. Uh, and so that becomes a bit of an interesting, interesting issue, yeah. probably an issue for another conversation, because I, I agree. I, I would summarize your initial take with my reference to the movie Big, which I'm one of like, I don't know, 10 people still alive who have seen it, I think. But I when Tom Hanks's character is sitting in the room and he's got the the robot that turns into a building and he's like, I don't get it. What's fun about playing with a robot, right? You have to look at these technologies when blockchain hit and NFTs hit and everyone's going crazy. And I'm like, so it's a JPEG, right? Now I know that NFTs are more than that. I get it. I understand the subtle nuance of what an NFT is, but no one cared. And yet people spent millions on these things, right? So be willing to say, I don't get it or be willing to say, I don't get it, but I want to know more. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's I always I did that with Bitcoin or, or blockchain yeah. in general um, is I always felt like, wow, this is super powerful, but I don't understand it. And I maybe foolishly never invested in it because I didn't understand it. So I don't invest in things sure. I don't understand. And uh, I've been fascinated by it. It's a it's a brilliant technology, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I think it has potential to solve some real problems. For sure. Um, you know, I don't think we've quite gotten there yet. People are focused more on what the value of Bitcoin is and the fact that it's, um, you know, $40,000 a coin versus it was, you know, a, a penny, you know, a few years ago. Um, but in the, in the AI world, I really see, you know, it is going to be game changing. It is going to be, you know, the, the transistor uh, moment or, you oh, know, yeah. you know, right, it, where, where, It'll be embedded in everything. You know, um, I play with home automation a lot, you know, and home assistant uh, yep. is my fave at this point. And, you know, uh, AI 
plugins to that seem like they make sense. So it starts inferring behaviors and understanding, oh, he likes this or does that, or she does this and does that. I can make that better for them and I can be proactive about doing things. And, um, you know, it looks like you're hot. So I'm going to turn on the air conditioner, that kind of stuff. I think it's super interesting. And that's something I'm going to be playing with and trying to figure out how to make happen. But uh, in a more, in a, in a bigger sense, in a broader sense, and in, in a more, maybe more impactful sense is, you know, as a tool to augment what we do today, augment learning, augment um, going to college, augment uh, communication, augment uh, creative thinking, um, I think is super great. Replacing humans doing the thinking, replacing humans doing the creative bit, replacing people doing the learning bit um, is where the where I think, you know, that we run into problems, both your your job point of view, which is you're, you're not making money anymore because this was my job and now this thing is doing it for me. Um, that's what we have to be mindful of as a society. And I don't, we're not very good at that because if there's a way to go save money, corporates are always going to try and do that and they're going to try and eliminate jobs. But I think in the end, um, there will be a normalization. There'll be a turbulent period that will suck, sure. unfortunately, but then there'll be a normalization that occurs um, as society both figures it out, as we as humans um, have decided what's really valuable um, and where we invest. Um, you know, I did sign up for that there needs to be, you know, I think Elon and some other people have put out a thing and I was a signatory on it, that there ought to be some thinking and regulatory guide rails put in place because mm -hmm. there's also the problem with AI and the internet and social media, by the way, um, to do bad. And um, that, those guardrails need to exist because today, AI, uh, you know, both image generation and the ability for it to create fake news, um, uh, and, which then drives people's behaviors is, is really big and bad um, because communication is powerful and wonderful um, as long as it's true and honest. Um, but people have figured out, oh, we can be dishonest and send crap and drive people's behaviors that create turmoil or create bad behaviors or create bad choices, both in politics and in investing or in whatever it might be. Um, and AI has the potential to amplify that. Right. And so, right. Um, you know, that's where I think there needs to be some regulatory, at least, you know, not that it'll stop people, but it'll at least give them the hammer when they get caught that there's pain. So and maybe that yeah. will restrict it. So. It's it's fascinating. Uh, one of the ways I often I was talking to a, a another common friend Brian uh, this morning, and I was talking. I tend to boil things down sometimes inappropriately. Most of these problems can be traced back in some way, shape, or form to Napster. <laughs> we used we used to make copies of music off the radio. People used to make mixtapes. People used to sell tapes out of their trunks, but yep. it was unscalable, so no one cared. Right. Yeah. Every once in a while, one dude got busted because he was selling 10,000 mixtapes or whatever. Right. Then Napster came along and then LimeWire and the ability to share these things across this masterful Internet thing. And all of a sudden, the record industry cared and, and the shit hit the fan. So every time you see something massively scale, you realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a problem. Right. So the, the very eroding of the concept of fact or truth is sort of behind a bunch of this. We are crowdsourcing reality at this point. Yeah. And whatever the crowd seems to determine is true is now weighing the scales of truth, but the crowd isn't always authentic people, right? So you're essentially stuck in the ballot box with true counters. So right. it's going to be it's it's going to be an amazing uh, amazing world we're in, and and fortunately you and I get to still play in it for uh, at least a couple of decades here uh, before we ride off and start smoking meat full time. <laughs> so. Yeah, it'll be interesting. All right, and so you know as I've. I don't know, as I've gotten older or whatever it is, I become more philosophical about how technology impacts society. Uh, you know, I, I now have grandchildren and, and my children, and I look at how their lives are going to be. And, you know, I played a very, very small part in driving technology in general. And uh, and I want to I want to make sure that their lives are just better because somebody was a good engineer has come up with a great idea and then developed a new concept and made their lives better as opposed to making it more difficult. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference when you're, when you're in the engineering phases to come up with tech, you know, I never want to rein in innovation uh, because it might have a bad impact, but I don't know. we got to figure that out. It's, it's, well, hard. it's, 
the philosophical thing resonates with me. The older I get, the more philosophical. I, though I was a philosophy major uh, when I went into UCF originally, uh, I like the idea of sitting around thinking about stuff. It's just hard to get paid to do that. Um, but uh, I have a podcast I listen to all the time, uh, Making Sense with Sam Harris, and there was some recent episodes are great. It's, I think it's a fantastic podcast. But uh, the the discussion of better. The, the, the existence of improvement was discussed recently with a tremendous uh, philosopher whose name I can't remember was the guest. And, and I, and I tend to take the position you do, which is it's almost trivially true that things have gotten better, right? Yeah. They're not good for everyone, right. right? There's still people that die of malaria. There's still starvation across the world. There's still slavery. Is it better than it was 50 years ago, almost across the board? Probably so. I don't know, but probably so. How can technology make it better? Well, we have to keep pushing that envelope and we have to try and anticipate the unexpected consequences or you know, the perverse incentives that will drive people uh, right. because we are human animals. Make no mistake, while we're capable of incredible goodness, and this was from the gentleman whose name I can't remember. I'll put it in the notes uh, on this podcast. We are just as capable of barbarism yeah, right, as human animals. And, and some could argue we're more likely to, to lean towards barbarism. So we have to have our better angels guide us towards whether that is, you know, I don't care if it's a religious construct of yours or not, uh, whether you just take into consideration you are your brother's keeper, which we start talking about AI, you start bringing in the discussion of how universal basic income, all sorts of things start to become a thing. Because at the end of the day, I have to believe, and I'm not someone of any sort of a religious background, that we're not here to just work and die. We're here to make an impact on the people that we affect, yeah. whether it's our family, our friends, uh, or, or just the people in the culture that we operate in. So, and that being said, I'm, I am incredibly blessed, a word that I don't use often because it does have such religious uh, connotation, uh, to have folks like you in my life and Frank and Michelle and Tom and the people you mentioned, right? Uh, and drag you onto these podcasts. So I want to thank you for spending your Friday afternoon when you could have just as well been doing cool things like preparing food for this weekend. Yeah, I'm or still going to do that. <laughs> Good. Good. What are you cooking this weekend? Uh, I'm going to do a uh, lemon Greek church, uh, uh, chicken. So that's one okay. night when I'm smoking a turkey, um, Sunday night. Excellent. Excellent. I, I have a percussion event for my son, uh, down, well, not your neck of the woods. You're, you're out a uh, different direction, but down at Bear Creek indoor percussion contest all day, Saturday. And then Sunday I'm taking all of my cooking apparatus apart and doing a catastrophic clean wow. so that I can get back to cooking for my, uh, for my cooking YouTube channel. <laughs> which is very fun. Uh, well, thanks. Well, Andy, I want to thank you for joining me today. I know it's took probably a little longer than you expected, but I really appreciate it. Is there anything you want to leave people with? You don't do a lot of social media, so you can't be like, follow me at Andy's a cool guy, you know, on no. Twitter or whatever. But no, I think, you know, people who know me, uh, you know, I, I am always here to help. I'm happy to happy to philosophize anytime with you. Um, you know, these are the core beliefs that I have. I, nothing I've shared has been intently marketing oriented. I have, my career is done as far as I'm concerned. As soon as I'm done with Virgin Voyages, I'm going to spend time with the grandkids. So I'm not out trying to sell anything. These are things I truly believe and things that I've learned over my life. And I hope they're helpful to somebody else along the way. Well, that's the essence of what we're doing here is trying to learn from these things and, and yeah. share those things. And we can share them over a, a fire uh, at Margaritaville at some point in the near future with our that friends. Awesome. Uh, so thanks again, Andy. I appreciate you joining. And uh, and we'll uh, we'll see you down the road, I'm sure. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And that, dear listeners, wraps up another fascinating episode of Plain Spoken. Today, we had the incredible opportunity to dive deep into the mind and career of Andy Schwab, a visionary whose journey through technology and leadership has left an indelible mark on every organization he's graced. From the magical, magical corridors of Disney to the innovative decks of Virgin Voyages, Andy's story is a testament to the power of authenticity, innovation, and principled leadership. Some key points from today's episode. Leadership through authenticity. Andy reminded us that true leadership is about being hands-on, leading by example, and fostering a culture built on mutual respect and shared passions. It's never asking others to do things you would not do yourself. The importance of culture. We learned about the critical role of company culture and how that plays a vital part in driving innovation and ensuring employee satisfaction. A supportive and positive environment isn't just nice to have. It's essential to success. Technology and storytelling. Andy's work, especially at Virgin and Disney, uh, has, has really shown us the transformative power of integrating technology with storytelling 
to create unforgettable experiences. Staying ahead with innovation. From the agile methodologies to addressing the future of AI, Andy's career has been about embracing change and innovation, and always looking for ways technology can enhance our lives and work. And last but not least, ethical engagement with technology. As we look to the future, the conversation around AI and emerging technologies reminds us of the need for ethical considerations and the impact these advancements will have on society. As we close today's episode, I want to challenge each of you to reflect on the lessons that Andy shared with us. How can you lead with more authenticity? What can you do to contribute to a positive and supportive culture in your own workspaces? And most importantly, how can you engage with technology, not just for the sake of innovation, but in ways that genuinely improve the lives of others and respect ethical boundaries? Let's not be passive observers of change. Let's be active participants in shaping a future that we can all be proud of. If Andy's stories inspired you, consider how you can make a difference in your sphere whether it's through leadership, innovation, or ethical engagement with technology. I want to thank you again for joining us on Plain Spoken. We're only a few episodes into this, and I'm having a great time. I'm hoping you are enjoying it as well. If today's conversation sparked any thoughts or ideas, we'd love to hear from you. Share your reflections with us on social media or drop us an email. Until next time, keep striving for excellence in all that you do. And remember, the future, it's not just something we enter. It's something we create. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show and found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then, keep growing. What the, what the, what the, what the, what the,